Uh, thank you very much. Welcome to, uh, oh wait, are we presenting on the screen? Boom shakalak. Now, oh, no, that's not the one we want. How about we do this? Right on. Building a Heroku and Force.com architectures and extending your Salesforce deployment. If you're not, uh, if this isn't the session that you were looking for, don't leave. This is the session that you want to hear, even if you didn't know it at the time. Um, come on in. We got plenty of seats, plenty of room up front. No exploding watermelons, no uh, hoses. We're not going to throw corn chips at you or anything like that. Uh, we're dead serious. This is, this, is, this is the serious room, too. So I don't want any laughing, no matter how funny I am, okay? Um, this is uh, brought to you uh, by our great sponsor, Trailhead DX and Salesforce. Uh, we're very excited to be here. Uh, my name is Gordon Jackson. Uh, uh, anyone old enough to know who that is on the, the image? Anyone? Shout it out. Right on. There we go. I don't know the guy, but I, I thought he was a likeness. I can get out there. I like to do that. Uh, how many use Chatter? How many of my Chatter users out here? All right, so this is, I like to change up my avatar. So this is my current avatar. I never put a real picture out there because I'd freak people out. Um, I've been with Salesforce for uh, about seven years. Uh, anyone ever seen me speak before? Come on, tell me. <sighs> All right, one or two of you, okay. Uh, I do these things from time to time. It, it's a great pleasure to get in front of uh, customers and other developers. Um, I've specialized in both Force.com and in Heroku, so I speak both platforms. Um, today, I'm hoping that everyone here is a little Heroku curious, and, uh, and we're, gonna, we're gonna peel back the layer of the onion, talk about some architectures, um, and answer the question that is usually on most people's mind is, what the heck is Heroku, right? Um, this is a session for you folks. Uh, normally I'd invite you to ask questions if we were in a meeting, but we've got a lot of people here. So we are gonna do a Q&A session uh, at the end. So hold your questions till about the 30 minute mark uh, and we'll make sure that we hit them. You guys have seen this, I'm not gonna go into it. Uh, so welcome to my presentation. Uh, we are gonna do really three basic things here. We're gonna talk a little bit uh, about you guys and ladies. We're gonna ask some questions. Just show of hands, a little audience participation. Then we'll look at some use cases. We'll just look at some architectural diagrams and I'll wax philosophical about why they might be interesting to you. Uh, and then we'll do a little hands-on cooking show, just a tiny little bit, uh, just to introduce you to some of the things that you may not have seen before. Sound good? Still in the right room? No one's leaving, well that's just good. Plenty of room up front, come on. We're gonna need, we're gonna pull a volunteer from the front row. Uh, no, I'm only kidding, please come in and sit down. All right, so. Show of hands, let's have a look-see. Have you, where am I, first off, where are my Salesforce MVPs? Raise your hand, be proud. One, there we go, right on, thank you. <laughs> Salesforce MVPs rule, okay. Now, how many of you folks are out there, uh, my Salesforce admins that are on their way to being MVPs? Anybody out there doing admin work? Great. Uh, Force.com, Apex, Visual Force developers. Excellent, That's what, we're not gonna talk about any of those things today, but it's good to have you in the room. Uh, this is important. Now, okay, how many Heroku developers? Well, all right, a, so like for, for business or for fun and pleasure on weekends? You don't have to answer that. I'm, I'm gonna assume that it's all business in here because I told you this was the serious room, okay? So you've built applications on Heroku, so now where are the rest of you? How many of you have ever wondered what this Heroku thingy is and uh, would like to learn a little bit more? So a couple of hands up the eye. Right, so the, oh, you all sat over on this side of the room. All right, so I'll be talking, to, no, we're gonna talk to everyone, okay? So uh, hopefully by the time we're done, we'll be able to answer the age-old question, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot Heroku, okay? And along the way, uh, what I can do with it and why would I be interested in using Heroku alongside uh, Force.com? Uh, so let's whiskey tangle Foxtrot, Heroku. Okay, so Heroku is in many respects a service. In the world of DevOps, right? You guys and ladies, you dev, Heroku ops. Uh, and really one of the founding principles of the organization uh, when it was started back in 2008-ish and uh, prior to acquisition by Salesforce in 2010, uh, is really to uh, make the developer's life as simple as possible. Focus on writing great code 
let us take care of the, uh, the, uh, the challenging or the boring or the interesting, however you want to look at it. But really, Heroku as a service, fundamentally what we do is we make Amazon invisible to you. So as you may or may not know, Heroku runs entirely on Amazon Web Services. So if you've ever played with Elastic Bean thingy or uh, you've done EC2 computing or RDS, all of those things uh, from an operational perspective, uh, bringing those services together so that you at some point can do a Git push Heroku master um, is work. And when the founders, uh, they were writing a lot of Ruby code and they found that they were spending a large part of their time managing the operational aspects of that infrastructure as a service. Uh, and they said, well, gee whiz, what if we put together a super fantastic team of operational specialists, okay, and, uh, and make that available to you, and we'll call it a Heroku because we like the way it sounds, hero haiku warrior, right? Um, but it wasn't just a matter of, all right, let's provide some operational expertise. Let's also provide some special sauce. Let's, like, let's take operations to that next level. So for those of you that write code in Java or in Node or in Ruby or in Python or in PHP or in Scala or in Clojure, oh my. We, Heroku, Salesforce, we manage those language frameworks. So we do all the curation on that. You're always running on the latest version of Java. You're always running on the latest version of Node. Uh, what you don't see are the operating systems that uh, we're running that code in, right, the containers. We, we manage that too. So uh, from an operations perspective, we have one flavor operati operating system. We provide the patching, the securing, the maintenance of the operating system. So, and they're hardened Linux containers for the really curious. Second only to Amazon, Heroku provides the largest number of commercially available Postgres databases. So we manage and curate Postgres. In fact, we're active contributors to the Open Postgres project. And we make Postgres the database available as a service to you. Additionally, we have an add-on marketplace of well over 150 vendors, and we're always looking for more, that provide components and services that developers can take advantage of while they're building their applications. And in fact, Heroku Postgres is just one of several data storage services that are available in Heroku. If you wanted a Hadoop style database or a Mongo database or a MySQL database, we have providers making these available for the Heroku environment. But it's not just data stores. It's the things that you might have to build if you were building your application from scratch that you don't want to build because I want to build the interesting things that pertain to my business. So logging, uh, while Heroku makes your logs available to you as a stream, so you can, you can just ingest the logplex stream directly if you've got a Splunk or a Sumo logic running in your environment, you can just digest those logs directly. But you three guys in a garage focusing on writing the next big interweb application, you might take advantage of Paper Trail, which is an add-on service. And monitoring the application, New Relic comes to mind immediately as a uh, monitoring and metrics type service, or email, or SMS messaging, or just about anything that you would be using in an application that you might have to build yourself. So the Auto Marketplace is a very vibrant uh, uh, community, and for those of you still kind of scratching your heads, very similar to our App Exchange, with one very notable difference. In the App Exchange, once you've decided that, hey, this, this package is really good, I think we're going to buy it, you engage in a commercial relationship with the vendor that's providing that particular force.com package. With the add-on marketplace, begin because we focus on the developer and that developer experience, those add-ons are just part of the environment that you get as a Heroku customer. Meaning, if you're a developer and you want to go ahead and take advantage of Paper Trail, you just add Paper Trail to your application. Heroku is the first line of support for these add-on services. And we have uh, uh, what we call a customer success architect, very similar to um, the Salesforce role, who have knowledge on these different things and can help you in building your applications and understanding. 
you know, what are the more popular ones? What are, what are folks using? So a very vibrant add-on marketplace. We call that Heroku Elements. And then at the top of the stack there is Heroku Connect, and this is yet another add-on. It's available to our enterprise customers, and Heroku Connect is gonna be instrumental to many of the things that we'll talk about in a few minutes around architecture, in that with Heroku Connect, it provides us with the connective tissue between my Salesforce data and my Heroku Postgres data. So it allows me to synchronize information that I store and manage within Salesforce and I can take advantage of uh, in my declarative environment. And when that data I want to make available to perhaps other systems or uh, other applications that I might build on Heroku directly, very easily I can move that into Postgres. Uh, and likewise, conversely, if I have information flowing into Postgres, I can use that mechanism to move data into Salesforce. Uh, and then lastly, at the very top of the stack there, when we talk about scaling and load balancing and failover, all of those things, again, are features of the service. Fundamentally, when you deploy an application in Salesforce, you know that it's going to be up and running 24 by 7, 365 days a year, because that's part of the service that you get with Salesforce. You get an operational staff that keeps that up and running. In Heroku, it is the same thing. Once you've configured and deployed your application into the Heroku environment, it's our job to carry the pager. It's our job to keep the lights on. And in the instances where, how many remember Heartbleed from last year when everybody's hair burst into flames while you were trying to figure out which of your systems were impacted by that zero day exploit? Within 24 hours, we had patched the operating system and then propagated that out to well over a million applications running on Heroku, and none of our customers were the wiser. So within 24 hours, this is the type of operations. You get peace of mind. We carry the page or you party hard on a Saturday night and roll in on Sunday morning and know that everything is okay. Speaking of partying, how, how many went to uh, Thievery Corporation last night? Enjoy the show. Raise, raise a hand. I, I know you're probably a little hurt and like me. No, no, no. It was a great show. Um, so, so Heroku is, you know, a service. As part of the Salesforce platform, it's important to keep in mind that Heroku is part of the Salesforce platform. It's Salesforce. Heroku's the brand. Heroku runs on Amazon, but the notions of trust, the notion of being part of the Salesforce platform, being in the Salesforce family when your customers want Salesforce product, then Heroku's an option. Now, this isn't to say that folks that are running on force.com on Salesforce, running our CRM and service cloud applications, will ever need a Heroku. You may not, and certainly don't need to have it available. And likewise, if you're building the next great Node application or Java application and you're running on Heroku, you may not ever really touch the CRM in Salesforce. But the customers that are leveraging Heroku and Salesforce together you're finding that there are options architecturally to do things that one or the other system may not be uh, the best at or might just not be tuned as well uh, for the services or the processing uh, that you might like to do. So I like to describe the platform, Heroku plus Heroku Connect plus Force.com uh, as the gestalt of Salesforce, right? The whole is actually greater than the sum of its parts. And hopefully by the time we've gone through some of these architectures and done a little hands-on cooking, we see how easy this is, uh, hopefully you'll agree. On the, uh, let me see, which are we looking at this? So on the left-hand side of the diagram, everything that my force.com folks are familiar with, you developers, right? That declarative environment, all of those great tools. I refer to Salesforce as, you know, as this great application that's really already realized. The application's built for you. You can go in and you can add custom objects. I can create custom workflows. I do this declaratively if I'm really squeezing every bit of value out of that system. And then we have other great things that are part of that great application, chatter for collaboration, not only with other humans, but with my data. I love the idea that my data can speak to me. I think chatter's huge. Uh, reports and dashboards, workflow. I can train a savvy business analyst how to model their business and move at the speed of business, right? and take advantage of all of those great things. 
and when the environment doesn't give the business the flexibility uh, either in the user interface, because we give that to you too, you get that right out of the box, you can create your own user interface. Uh, in the olden days, I would say, we, we would do that with visual force, and, and you're probably still using visual force. Uh, in the, the new hotness, we're building lightning components now. Okay, so you've got the ability to revert to a more traditional programmatic style of development. Not necessarily in the hands of the business analysts now, we, we go back to the hands of, of our friends, the IT practitioners, uh, and the folks that are providing process and practice and governance over my environment. Um, and then likewise, when computationally a workflow or a flow um, or you know, any of the tools that we make available to you declaratively doesn't quite get you what you're looking for computationally, you can always step into Apex, our purpose-built language for a multi-tenant environment, and write code. It looks and smells and tastes, looks and sm well, it looks like Java, okay? And you can take advantage of it for, it's it very easy to step into. And then on the right-hand side, Heroku now, as a platform, as a service, is the exact opposite. There's nothing written except Heroku Connect. It is a bucket of resources is the way I've uh, colloquially described it in the past. I have computational resources, elastic computational resources. We call those dynos. That's where your code will execute. And we have add-on resources, all of those components from the elements marketplace that I will use in conjunction with my application. Okay, and it's there that I can go ahead and deploy my Java application or my Ruby application or my Node application. And deployment into the environment is as simple as I've got code on my local directory, I've done some writing, I'm using the tools that I use every day. Heroku makes no requirements on the developers on the tools that you use. If you write in Eclipse, keep writing in Eclipse. If you use Sublime Text and you maybe a little sprinkling of Maven's Mate in there, how many use Sublime and Maven's Mate? Just out of curiosity, I love that. Okay, super, super easy to use, it's fantastic. Um, so no requirement, if you wanna write in Notepad, go for it, okay? If, uh, did I say Notepad? I meant Notepad. Um, party on, and the same with your source code management, no requirements. Now you'll hear us say Git Push Heroku Master, and that is, the transport mechanism that we use, so you've got to know a little bit of Git, but if you're using SVN, if you're using source safe, if you're an old guy you're like me writing in Emacs and saving your code to CVS, keep going. Okay, but when your code needs to get to Heroku, we do a git push Heroku master, and that's where the magic happens. I, all I'm moving is my source code as defined by my project, right? So if I'm in Java, I'm using Maven. Gradle, if I'm in Node, I'm using NPM. Uh, if I'm a list pack, any list packers out there? Like closure, <sighs> kids. Um, <laughs> I'm only kidding. Uh, the package manager, we just send that over. We recognize that in, again, a half a dozen commonly used open source languages for building fantastic web-based applications. Uh, and then we just take it from there. We'll compile the code. We'll grab the libraries. We'll make sure that everything that you've specified your code needs to run, we compile it down to this thing called a slug, and then we pop it into a container. We call those things dynos. And then it's up and running. Once that code is deployed and running, it's our job to keep it up and running. So on the left-hand side, declarative. On the right-hand side, programmatic. Bringing the two together is Heroku Connect. And we'll talk a bit more as we go through the use cases. So when I look at the application development continuum, when I think of uh, the folks, uh, all of you great developers and, uh, and gearheads and geeks, I like to get people to unleash their inner geek. Um, you can start in Salesforce modeling your environment, taking advantage of the force.com platform, and never write a line of code, right? Take advantage of those out-of-the-box tools. Take advantage of drag-and-drop lightning components, okay? I've got a data store that's available to me. I don't have to think about it. I don't manage it. In fact, it's an abstraction. I interact with SQL, not SQL, because we do all the care and feeding. We manage that. And Effectively, all I really need to have is a good, solid admin or administrative team to provide that governance 
uh, in the environment so that I can easily enable a business analyst in a sandbox to go ahead and model the new product or the new service or the new workflow that facilitates your organization in running their business. Uh, and as we move to the right in the continuum, we get from functional, you know, the declarative into more of that model-driven environment. So I've got, you know, my out-of-the-box, uh, you know, my schema builder, I can do that, but I still have to write a little code because I've got requirements that, that go beyond um, what I can do with an out-of-the-box workflow. Um, Clicks and code, you've heard us, we, you know, for years we talked about clicks, not code, right? And again, if we're using Salesforce for what it was really designed for, right, you get that clicks, not code. Uh, but sometimes you get a code. All the way over onto the right-hand side when we get to creating, uh, you know, very customized applications, web scale. If I'm going to be writing code, let me write in a language that um, is uh, my choice. So I've got no developers, we can get those uh, fresh out of college. Everybody seems to be digging on JavaScript these days, which is astounding to me for somebody that was you know, fighting with JavaScript 25 years ago uh, in trying to get it to run in Internet Explorer 6 versus uh, Mozilla. Um, build it from scratch, there's nothing, you've got a bucket of resources in Heroku. Uh, and you're a programmer, you're writing code, you're, you're a, a hacker. So in, in terms of the, let me see, am I clicking here? I guess not. Wait, there we go. So in terms of, you know, so the next 10 minutes, let's take a look at some of these architectures and a little bit about why, there we go. Oh, good God. There we go, sorry about that. Um, why, why, you know, why, why bring Heroku into the mix, right? The first one, and we see this on a regular basis, I think, and this isn't unnatural. This, you know, I don't want anybody to sit there and say, oh my God, wait, we bought Salesforce and now you're telling me I'm going to run into large data volumes? Hello, if you're using the product the way you want to use it, you're accumulating data. At some point, you have a lot of data. At some point, you might be on the phone with support folks saying, hey, I've got a lot of data and things are running kind of slow. There are things that we can do to help tune the environment. Everyone's sort of been through maybe the skinny tables or the indexing thing. But at some point, your data is large and it's no longer operationally significant, right? It's not showing up on reports and dashboards, but from a regulatory perspective, the boss said we had to hang on to the data. Data is expensive in Salesforce. It's tied directly to the security model. That's why some of our reports run slowly because it's got to check and see which attributes I'm supposed to be able to see in my data, right? How many, how many have been through sort of that nut roll? You know, kind of trying to figure things out. Yeah, everyone has. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It means you're using Salesforce. It means that you're being successful with it. Um, it just means that I've got to think about, wow, you know, long term, I've got to do something with my data. So large data volumes with mature customers, we start seeing them looking for options. And this is right where Heroku starts to, to shine because I've got options. I can take that non-operationally significant data now and leverage Heroku Connect and move that data from Salesforce into Heroku Postgres, it's a lower cost of ownership in terms of storing the data because there's no security model there other than what you apply programmatically to that database, right? So I'm hanging on to it. I can always bring that data back into Salesforce. I have the ability of using Salesforce APIs directly. I can use things like OData and Salesforce Connect to bring that data in as virtual data, right, external objects, and visualize it in the user interface. Or I can build a great application in Heroku that runs against a commercial grade single tenant relational database like Postgres and expose that whole application as a Canvas app in the context of whatever it is I happen to be doing. So you've got options. Um, Archiving of data is, is typically where we're seeing this really start to, to make sense. Organi so, so large data volumes come in two flavors. Archiving, it's no longer operationally significant, but I've got to hang on to it. Or I've got so much of this data, and you know, let's face it, we want to look at our data. We want to perform analysis, BI. Operationally, Salesforce shines you know, within the last 24 hours, the last week, you know, the last month. I can pull forward data. I can create my own reports and dashboards. 
But at some point when I've got 50 million, 70 million, 100 million records, and I really want to dig into what was my case load looking like? What, you know, how is that, you know, how has that transpired over time? Doing the types of BI in a multi-tenant environment, sometimes we run afoul of our processing governors, right? So the, or, or just the amount of data that I can manage uh, in a process within the core force.com platform. So now I move it, I unleash my data into a single tenant, highly scalable environment. So uh, commonly to see that for either large data volumes for processing purposes or for archival, right? Um, CPU intensive calculations. So like I've got to grind through my data, whether it's BI or I just I have some processing that I need to do. Force.com and Apex, again, as a general purpose tool, very flexible. But when I need to start doing, I'm not going to build Call of Duty 7 on Force.com and Apex. So get that out of your head right now. It's not going to happen. You might do it on Heroku, though. So what we have customers doing is anything from synchronizing the data because I can do other things with it in Postgres or just like batching it up in uh, using uh, the bulk APIs and sending that data over to Heroku when I need to because the bulk APIs are pretty quick and processing it in Heroku and then maybe sending some response back. So computationally challenging components of your application or your functionality or just requirements very easily handled within uh, Heroku. Uh, data warehousing, data integration, just you know, sort of another, uh, uh, not too different from uh, the processing model or the archiving model, but from an enterprise perspective, putting data into the cloud, going from Salesforce to another environment called Heroku, you wanna make sure that you have the controls to keep the boss comfortable. So Heroku Private Spaces is network isolated. It's a virtual private computing environment that you might have stood up on Amazon following about 20 different steps and that you would have to provide auditing and certification that it is in fact private. Or you can push a button, go get a cup of coffee, come back in eight minutes and have an entire carved out network isolated environment where I still have access to all those simple, beautiful, easy to use developer tools. So that now I can go ahead and create inbound whitelisted IP addresses. I get outbound IP addresses so that I can open up my firewall on my corporate LAN for inbound traffic. Hashtag safe harbor, this is forward looking stuff. Pretty soon you'll be able to do things like VPC peering from your private space into your Amazon applications because let's face it, Heroku is really going to give you a subset of all the workloads that you might run in our partner Amazon, right? For, for agility and for building the applications very quickly, web-based applications, especially the ones that connect directly to Salesforce, do it on Heroku. But occasionally you're gonna be running other web processes. Maybe you're running JBoss or WebLogic or WebSphere and you decide to move it from on-premises to the cloud. You're gonna put that in Amazon, all right? And somebody's gonna manage it. But the less that you have to toil with and the more your developers can focus on it, Heroku Private Spaces lets you sleep at night, right? We carry the pager, we're subject to that auditing, right? Um, CP, did I go the wrong way? I did. There we go. Um, last, last use case, right? How many are in, in, in flight in some flavor of Internet of Things project? Anybody out there doing uh, high volume streaming of data from devices? All right, you will be. It's coming, right? Um, we started to, to, to hedge our bets by uh, implementing Kafka as a service. All right, so you can actually stand up, a co again, push the button, get a cup of coffee, come back and have you know, a four node or an eight node Kafka cluster, able to process upwards of millions of streamed events per second. Okay, being able to have persistence up to seven weeks for that data, being able to replay that data, connecting to millions of consumer devices that are sending chatty little messages over. And know that I can get that information in, process it, and if something is out of line, right, my car is about ready to blow a gasket or something, create a case in Salesforce, notify the service technician so I get a proactive call, okay? Or I have the ability to look at what Gordon's doing from his blood glucose monitor that I fill out and, and check and, and submit to the uh, interwebs every day so that my care worker 
can see what my numbers are on a day-to-day -day basis and work with me proactively. So all the kinds of things that I can do by pumping in events, large volumes of things from multiple different places, processing them in an environment that again is inherently single tenant, elastically designed and nearly virtually unlimited processing because we all sit on top of Amazon services. Okay, um, so those are you know, just like a handful of use cases that we're seeing and uh, what I'd like to do in uh, just, a, and it'll only take me a few minutes and then we'll get to some Q&A, is just kind of show you how easy um, that is. Let's see, how do I, uh, see this is where my Macness gets me, there we go, that's what I'm looking for, right there. I think I have different screens here. How do I get everything back? Is anything show? Oh, it's showing up there. Oh, darn it. So uh, if you haven't figured it out, um, there we go. I'm new to the Mac. I just shifted it over a year ago from Windows, and I've been confounded ever since. Um, I'm in, a, I'm in my, my local directory, right? So I've got a, I've got a simple Node application that's running here. Uh, and I built some code. Trust me, it works. I want to create a Heroku application. I do Heroku create. So we've got a command line interface because um, developers don't like to move out of the environments that they're in and uh, instead would prefer to continue to work there. And I uh, am doing that in the way that a developer would. So I create, I've just created a simple application, right? I've got a Heroku create trailhead DX demo. It creates a space for me. I can send my code over there to compile it and everything, but I want to get right to that connective tissue. So I actually, and you don't actually have to have code in Heroku. Let's be clear about that. I can just run a database out there and use that as a web database if we wanted to. So let's go ahead and come out to, uh, my, uh, no, see, I didn't want to do that. I'm going to exit the show here for a second. There we go. Thank you. Boom. All right, so here's my Heroku dashboard. Uh, and uh, let me go ahead and get to my uh, personal environment. And then, look, there's my trailhead demo, right? So uh, immediately it's created. So you can access the environment in a couple of ways. This, the command line interface. I can do a lot of scripting with it. Everything that I do in the dashboard that you're going to see me do right now, I can do uh, in that command line environment, right? I get a little heads up screen here. Uh, I want to go ahead and look at some resources. And what we want to do is add that Postgres database. How easy is it for me to get a Heroku Postgres database? I type in Postgres. I go to Postgres. It gives me some options, right? Look at this, I can use the free version. We've got so many free, every one of the add-ons out there has a free tier. You can sign up for Heroku Postgres today and use a free version of the database. So let's go ahead and use that. We'll provision it. Okay, so I've got a database. How, like, when was the last time you got a database in about 30 seconds, right? Heroku Postgres, it's ready for me to start using it. I used to be the database guy when I worked at Sun Microsystems because they thought, they thought I was a masochist or something. 25 disks from Oracle to install the Oracle database, hair pulling, calls to support. Uh, maybe it was just like a, a hazing thing, I'm not sure. Uh, so I need Heroku Postgres, let's look at Heroku uh, Connect. There it is, boom, it's another add-on. I grab that and uh, I get a free edition, so you can kick the tires on this. We'll allow you to synchronize up to 10,000 rows. It's only available with Heroku Enterprise, though, so you can't sign up for Heroku Connect uh, in a private or personal account, so keep that in mind. Um, so we've deployed it, and uh, what we want to do is configure it. Configuring it, this is where you, the developer, can sit down and work with uh, the admin or the developer in your Salesforce environment. Um, this is where, oh good, thank God. It's, it's grinding away the interwebs here. Great, all right, just need to set up the connection. All right, so it's identified. Notice that it's identified my Heroku Postgres database, okay? It's given me a default schema name of Salesforce. I can change this. I can also have multiple instances of Heroku Connect associated with the same application connected to different Salesforce orgs. Remember that large data thing? You might have multiple, how many have worked in environments where you have multiple Salesforce orgs in your company? And everybody wants to see everything else from everybody else's org. Yeah, right? Aggregate it in Postgres, make it available as an external object in each of those orgs, and boom, you're up and running, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and say next. 
And uh, so it's doing some initialization. All right, look, I can run this in production against the sandbox, against my custom domain. Always use the current latest and greatest version of the API, but know that if you need to go back in time for whatever reason, you can. I'm going to authorize it. Uh, let's see if I can remember the password. Boom, yeah, don't remember that. And uh, so what it's doing is it's just, I've just, I've created, this is an API level user. I've provided a license to access Salesforce, right? This is a typical integration pattern, API user. Uh, and all I want to do is create a mapping. So in this case, I click the create a mapping. It's, it's introspecting the metadata of my object environment. And I know that I have, uh, I've got uh, some contacts because I want to make sure that uh, I can collect contact information from people on the interwebs. These aren't licensed users, there's somebody that's using my app. They fill out a form, they want more information. Um, and I can identify, what do I want? I want the, um, I want my, uh, I want the email address, I want the first name, uh, gender's important, okay, home phone is good, uh, where's my last name, boom, save. And what I've just done is created a mapping from that contact information in Salesforce and copied it into my Heroku Postgres database. It took me all of maybe 30 seconds to do this without the talking. And if we just go ahead and take a look at the Explorer, we look at my contact, I can select Gordon Jackson and look at my data and I can see right there, I've just synchronized it. When updates happen in Salesforce, now that they're connected, whenever I make an update in Salesforce, it's gonna flow into Heroku Postgres. If I had to check the box, it would have easily, I can update it in Postgres from my web application and synchronize that data back into Heroku. So very quick, quick and dirty, go back and watch the video, you might have blinked. Um, let's get back to the presentation and wrap this up, okay? So we've demoed something. We've got a few minutes and we've got uh, our young Natalie here, she's gonna walk around with the microphone. Are there any questions? Can I answer any questions for anyone? Any questions? What happens if you go faster than the speed of light? Anyone know? <laughs> is is uh, Heroku Connect connecting real time with Salesforce? So I, I would hesitate to call it real time. Okay, when the synchronizations take place, it's done through polling. So I can specify a polling <clears throat> a polling limit of as often as two minutes. <coughs> Excuse me or as infrequently as every 60 minutes, okay? So this isn't change data capture, okay? There are probably likelihoods of if I've made changes to the record in sequence within that two minute period that some of the, you're just gonna get the, the current version of it every time we look at it. If you need to synchronize things faster than the polling mechanism, you can take advantage of Salesforce streaming APIs, meaning you check the streaming box, we will listen on uh, uh, the bus for any streaming updates. But even still, that's dependent upon how busy your org is and how busy the database is. But roughly about every 10 seconds, we'll synchronize that. And be careful, because if you try to do that with a lot of objects, the streaming API has its set of governor limits. So, and while those things, you know, you, we constantly bring those things up, um, but it's still something to be aware of. Answer your question? Yep, uh, I, do, I do have another question, though. So, is there any use case that you could talk about where somebody has used Heroku Connect and Salesforce Connect in conjunction? Yes, so Heroku Connect and Salesforce Connect. Heroku Connect is, uh, apart from being a bi-directional synchronization engine, it also unlocks the capability of that Postgres database to be an OData producer. So now I can have all this highly transactional information, high volume, low value data flowing into Postgres. Not the best place to put it into, Hero into Salesforce though because I don't need to know every time Gordon brushed his, tooth his teeth with the squib toothbrush, but I'd like to know how the toothbrush is performing. So in those cases, I might take the data that's coming into Postgres that's connected to Salesforce with Heroku Connect, expose that as external objects by using Salesforce Connect, which is an OData consumer I point it at my endpoint in Heroku Postgres, identify the tables that I want to make available, and I'm up and running. I can virtualize a lot of the information in that Postgres database in the Salesforce UI. Answer your question? Right on. Uh, in use case of uh, archiving the data from the Salesforce world to the Heroku, can I specify which, account, which uh, records to archive? Basically, there's a maybe set of, uh, out of maybe, you know, 
some criteria basically, a Boolean or some kind of criteria. So uh, I'm going to give you the uh, yes, no, yes. Yes, you can. No, not the way you're thinking. Um, but yes, and here's how, okay? So Heroku Connect itself is a very simple beast. Once I've identified the object and the attributes and I turn it on, if I've got 50 million accounts, they're going to synchronize. So what you need to do is on the Heroku side, on the database side, you're going to build a little logic. Let's say I don't care about accounts that are older than six months. And you're going to look at the database, and you're going to look at that data. And as that data ages out, you're going to move that data from the active table that it's in and move it to another table, an archiving table. Okay? Once I've deleted that data from the synchronization table, it's going to propagate the delete back to Salesforce and delete the record on the Salesforce side. So this means that you've got to pay attention to the data that you're deleting. Because if you've got related records, again, you've got to synchronize the re related records. Remember, all the, the object ID information, everything remains intact. So you can still have the relationship, but we won't automatically say if you've got related uh, records to, so for, for contact instance, it's related to the account, right? We don't pull that in. I think the use case, what I was talking about is that I have data which is coming on the Salesforce org. Yep. And slowly and slowly, I want to, like, for example, only maintain last or latest 10 or, uh, yep. rows. That's so right. In that case, if I, the Heroku is syncing everything, yep. and if I delete the first 10, for example, it's going to delete those first 10, right? Yep. So I don't want that. What I want is that I, you know, as the things keep coming in, I just want to maintain first 10. Yeah, so, so, and again, Everything's going to synchronize into Postgres. You're going to create the logic that allows you to keep whatever you want to keep in Salesforce. So if it's, if you, it's only 10 records at a time, the, anything that's older than the 10th oldest record is going to go away. And as those things propagate through, you'll have some logic that checks that. So as you create data in Salesforce, it synchronizes into Postgres. You realize that you've done that. I delete the record here, and then I delete the next, that next oldest one on Salesforce. Same thing. I just have to have the. You're going to create the logic to filter and make that happen on, Post, on, on Heroku. And so deleting it, can I move to another table, I guess? Yeah, sure. Right on. Yeah. So like once you're in the Heroku Postgres, you get stored procedures. You can create triggers. You can have logic running in a separate dyno that goes ahead and does all kinds of crazy things. One more question. Anybody? Young man in front. So you mentioned how accessing multiple orgs data through, I guess, Postgres. Mm -hmm. um, we recently did a migration from an old org to a new org, and the new org had a lot of new mapping. Um, so first name might not be first name anymore. Now it's first, last name together. Stupid example, but representative. Right. So. I had to write up a Java program and then pull from, from each org separately, giant SQL tables with 10,000, actually hundreds of thousands of records. Yeah, often. right there. So would this have been a lot easier with? I, 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 yeah, I think it would be for, for a number of reasons, right? Because you can take your entire data set, okay, in an environment that's designed for large volumes of data that's single tenant, that is ungoverned, unlimited. You just use the resources that you need. So I can take everything in bulk, pop it into one table in, in Heroku Postgres, do my processing, my folding, spindling, mutilating, normalization, pop it into the next table, off it goes into Salesforce. Yeah. That's a common pattern that we're seeing evolve now. And then what if I wanted to generate reports uh, showing that the migration that's already been done, let's say, is, uh, you know, first name here is equal to first name here. Uh, off the top of my head, you've got, remember, you've got this Postgres database, so you've, you're in charge of the changes that you're making, so that you can report off that Postgres database as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. You bet. So uh, for those, thank you for everyone that's still stuck around. That's great. Uh, make sure, listen, if, you, if you're sitting there saying, oh, my God, i got to get me some of that, right? Start on Trailhead, right? You can check out Heroku Enterprise Basics if you're not familiar with it. The Salesforce and Heroku integration module will take you through a lot of the things that I've just talked about as in terms of mechanically what does that look like, right? And then there's a nice quick start out there for getting familiar with and using Heroku Connect. That's it for me. Thank you so much for coming. You guys have been a great audience. Awesome questions. One more thing. You'll get a survey, right? 
Gordon Jackson, right? Just remember that, okay? <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs>